Welcome to this tutorial about syntactic categories. Now, in the last tutorial that I gave, we talked about um, how to identify uh, constituents and use those constituents to analyze the structure, the internal structure of a sentence. In this uh, lesson, we are going to talk about how to take that analysis of the internal structure of a sentence and extend it to other sentences so that you can create rules for how to create new sentences. Last lesson, I showed you how to create a uh, structure like this uh, that analyzes the internal structure of, a sen of the sentence, the yellow dog liked the chocolate cake. And in syntax, we call this sort of uh, graphic, we call it a tree structure. And that's because it looks like an upside down tree, right? So we have at the top sort of the root and it has some branches going out toward the leaves where the, where the, um, the words at the end of the branches look like leaves, right? So we call this a tree structure. And um, if you're just presented with a tree structure for a sentence and you didn't yourself do the analysis of what is a constituent, you can see the constituents within the structure because all that you have to do is imagine you're chopping off a branch of the tree, right? So let's say we wanna chop off this branch of the tree, this whole right-hand branch of the tree. Um, anything that we would chop off by making that one cut, that chunk right there is a constituent. Right, so we could try making cuts in different places and we'll get different constituents. So let's try cut here instead, right? That identifies that chunk as being a constituent, right? Let's try one, right? Uh, let's chop that off and see what we get, right? So those are that's how you identify constituents in a syntactic tree that you're given. Now, what happens when we do chop that off? When we actually get rid of that, we get this phrase that's left hanging there liked the chocolate cake. Now, this is not a complete sentence. Um, it doesn't, you know, while, while you can get some logical meaning out of it, um, we don't know who's liking the chocolate cake, and so it's not complete. But the thing that we plug in in that spot does not have to be the yellow dog, right? So we could, in theory, plop something else in there and create a perfectly good sentence. So let's see what else we can plop into that spot. Marcus. We can plop the name Marcus into that slot, or really anybody's name, right? We could plop a name into that slot and it makes a perfectly good sentence. Marcus liked the chocolate cake. Now this doesn't have exactly the same meaning as the sentence we had before, but it has uh, the same sort of dependency between the relationship between the thing that we're plopping in and the rest of the sentence, right? So Marcus liking the cake and the yellow dog liking the chocolate cake, it's the same situation except the person or thing who's liking the chocolate cake has altered, right? Um, so not very much has altered about this sentence. We've just plopped a new being into that spot. So let's see. So, so we can replace the yellow dog with Marcus. Let's see what else we can replace the yellow dog with. That baby. So that's multiple words. We're replacing the yellow dog with a multi-word phrase. That baby liked the chocolate cake. Um, so we can replace the yellow dog with Marcus or with that baby um, or something even longer, a llama in striped pajamas like the chocolate cake, right? Um, we can replace that chunk with a lot of different things, right? We can replace the yellow dog with a llama in striped pajamas. So when two words or phrases are of the same syntactic category, then you can replace them with another, you know, within that same sentence. So within that sentence, this sentence, the yellow dog liked the chocolate cake, we have this slot, um, which we're putting in that golden box there. And anything that you can grammatically put into that golden box is going to be of the same syntactic category as the yellow dog. So the llama, a llama in striped pajamas, that baby, Marcus, they're all of the same syntactic category in this sentence in contrast to something that is not of the same syntactic category. For example, the word replied. Um, you can't make the sentence replied like the chocolate cake. Um, that's not allowed unless you, unless you alter your understanding of what the word replied means, right? So replied, you can't replace the yellow dog with the word replied. Um, you also can't replace the yellow dog with the word in the house. Um, uh, that's just not allowed. So these are of different syntactic categories from the yellow dog. And that may surprise you if you're thinking, oh, I know you, you're just doing nouns, right? Um, uh, is that you can't just plop any word describing a, 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 an entity into this slot, right? So bishop, you can't just plop the word bishop into this, right? To say bishop like the chocolate cake, um, that's not allowed. Unless 
Bishop is the name of a person or a dog. So maybe the yellow dog's name is Bishop, right? And then Bishop can like the chocolate cake, right? So unless Bishop is a name, um, unless you're reinterpreting the word Bishop, so it's not meaning like a person from a church, but it's meaning, um, you know, my dog who I've named Bishop, um, uh, you can't have it in that sentence. We've been looking at this golden chunk of, of the sentence um, and we've been looking at what other kinds of phrases can be the same uh, uh, syntactic category as the yellow dog. Um, we're going to put a name on this particular syntactic category. And I'm just going to ask you to bear with me. Um, we are going to call this a determiner phrase. And we'll come back later to why we call this a determiner phrase. Um, but that's the name for this particular syntactic category. And this syntactic category, um, we abbreviate with the phrase DP. So we're going to come back to this and why this is called a determiner phrase, even though it seems kind of like a noun. Um, we'll talk about why it's not called a noun phrase or something like that. Um, but we are calling anything that you can plop into that slot a determiner phrase. And now we're going to move over to a different constituent. We're going to look at what goes over in this green box and what we can do when we chop off that constituent. What can we replace that constituent with um, in that slot? So the first thing we can do is we can replace that whole chunk with the word jumped. That whole enormous chunk of uh, liked the chocolate cake can just be replaced with the word jumped, and that makes a perfectly good sentence. The yellow dog jumped. It's not no longer liking a chocolate cake, it's now just jumping. Notice you can't replace it with any old verb, right? So there's only certain verbs that you can plop in that slot. You can't say the yellow dog kissed. That's not allowed. You can't replace lick, lick the chocolate cake with kissed. Right, so there's some verbs that you can plop into that spot, but others you can't. So um, this is sort of a funky thing that may surprise you um, initially. So you can't put a transitive verb in that in that situation. Um, however, you can use that same verb and create a big phrase out of it, and then it's allowed. Right, so the yellow dog kissed the hand of the queen is is completely permissible in this context. How we can have effectively divided our sentence into two big chunks. Um, we've got the, the DP on the left side and the VP on the right side. Um, and we've talked about how we can exchange those constituents for other um, constituents of the same syntactic category. We haven't really talked about what makes a syntactic category yet, but, but there is this fact that there are some things you can plop into that spot and some things you can't. And we've identified some of the things you can plop into that spot and some of the things you can't. So effectively, what we have here is that we can replace that DP or the VP with other things. Um, and in fact, we, can cr we could replace both of those things. Um, and that gets us new sentences that are, we can predict will be completely acceptable um, based on this pattern, right? So essentially what we have is a DP and a VP come together to make a new syntactic category, which we call a sentence. Right, and we can write this as like an equation, right? A D P plus a V P creates an S, creates a sentence, right? Um, and anything that fits that description D P or anything that fits that description V P, right? They're like variables in in algebra, right? Um, lets us create a sentence. This is called a syntactic rule. Now, when we're writing syntactic rules, we use this funny sort of um, uh, ordering of things. So instead of D P plus V P equals S. We write it as S arrow, right? And S is made up of a DP plus a VP, right? So that's the that's how we write syntactic rules, just for various long-standing reasons. This is how these are these are written. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to make a few more of these rules by identifying a few more syntactic categories and figuring out how we create these categories. We're going to start by looking at what can go in this orange box. So we've already looked at that whole chunk, the yellow dog, but we haven't looked at what can go in that orange box within the yellow dog. In this orange box slot, unlike in our gold box DP slot, we can put the word bishop just by itself, right? The bishop like the chocolate cake is completely acceptable. Um, so we can replace yellow dog with bishop. We can't replace the yellow dog with bishop, but we can replace yellow dog with bishop. And so the, they're of the same syntactic category. Let's try some. We can replace uh, yellow dog with rude interrupting cow, right? So I don't know if you've heard that joke, the rude interrupting cow joke. That's a, that's a 
that, does, that is very annoying. But um, we can replace yellow dog with rude interrupting cow. Um, we cannot replace yellow dog with a person's name, right? We can't say the Millie liked the chocolate milk. That's not allowed um, unless we're talking about, uh, you know, if we have a classroom with multiple people named Mary and we want to say the Mary with long hair or something like that. But then that's sort of a funky um, case, right? But we can't say the Millie liked the chocolate milk. Um, uh, we'll replace it with a DP right, like the llama in striped pajamas, right, we've already identified that the llama in striped pajamas can be a DP, um, so we can't say the, the llama in striped pajamas like chocolate cake, right, so that's not allowed. Um, so there are some things that are not allowed to occur in this slot. Now we called the last level a determiner phrase, um, but this level, this is also nouny, right, we're described, we're, the things that we're plopping in here are sort of nouns, so we're going to call this level a noun phrase. So this is why we didn't call the determiner phrase level a, a, a noun phrase, and it's because we were reserving noun phrase for this level, um, because this is sort of a deeper level of nouniness. Um, and so this one gets to be called a noun phrase. So this is an NP or a noun phrase. Um, and we'll see in a second uh, what the other side is. Let's look at this other side, this, this um, purple category in the box here, um, the. Right, so what can we put in in this sentence instead of the? Right, so one thing that we could say is that yellow dog. Right, um, it changes sort of our perspective on maybe where I'm standing relative to the yellow dog, or you know, if the yellow dog is in the room with me, or if we've been talking about yellow dogs before. Right, so that it gives us some more information, but doesn't significantly alter the meaning of the sentence to say that yellow dog. Um, so so we can replace the with that. Um, replace the with every. So this is a slightly different, this gives us sort of, that alters our meaning a little bit more, but every is also the same syntactic category as the, right? So we can replace the with every. Um, we can't replace it with something like reply. Reply yellow dog, like the chocolate cake. That just sounds really deeply bad to, to, to an English speaker's ear. Um, so we can't replace the with reply. Um, now let's look at this situation. So this one is complicated. Can we replace the with the smelly? Um, so this sentence sounds fine. The smelly yellow dog like the chocolate cake. Um, but as it turns out, this is a bad thing. We can't replace the with the smelly. It's not allowed. Now, why is it not allowed if it creates a perfectly grammatical sentence? The problem is that when you look at the structure of the sentence, the smelly yellow dog like the chocolate cake, um, the smelly is not a constituent. And the way that we've got our tree made would make it so that we were trying to make the smelly into a constituent and it's not a constituent of that grammatical sentence, right? And how do we tell it's not a constituent? We do tests. So who liked the chocolate cake? The smelly. Completely bad, does not give you the answer of the smelly yellow dog, right? Um, so the smelly in the sentence that's perfectly grammatical, the smelly yellow dog, um, is not a constituent, and so we can't plop it in as if it's a constituent. And so even though um, this seems like we can replace it, the smelly does not replace the in a, in, in a sentence, and so is not grammatical. So now we have another syntactic category, which we can replace um, the with that or every. Um, we can't replace it with reply or the smelly. Um, and so we are going to call this syntactic category after the kind of phrase that it helps us make. Um, we're going to call it a determiner. Now, of course, a determiner phrase is named after determiners, um, but this is what this is going to be called, is a determiner. Um, and now we have to uh, define two more syntactic categories. Um, and just like before, we could, uh, these two syntactic categories will come together to form a third syntactic category, which we've also already identified. So if we replace the determiner and or the NP, we can put those together to make a DP, right? So this will make something of the category DP, which we then can combine with verb phrases to make new sentences, right? Um, so uh, we have, in effect, made another syntax. We can take a D, any D, any determiner that we, we see out there in the world, that, every, some, this, um, uh, and put it together with anything that has the distribution of an NP, bishop, yellow dog, uh, root interrupting cow and create a um, successful DP. So our rule is a determiner plus a noun phrase gives us a determiner phrase. 
um, and we can put that into our grammar. Here's the list of rules that we're putting into our understanding of how you form sentences in a language, right? We have a sentence is made up of a determiner phrase, things that pattern like determiner phrases, plus a verb phrase, which is just things that pattern like verb phrases. Um, we can see that a determiner phrase is made up of a determiner and a noun phrase. Um, and we're going to add one more rule to our grammar before we end this lesson. Our last rule, we're going to look at the internal structure of verb phrases. So um, uh, what we've got down here in this corner, the chocolate cake, actually turns out is just going to be another DP. And we can show that because we can replace the chocolate cake with all the things that we've already decided are determiner phrases. So we can replace the chocolate with Marcus, the yellow dog like Marcus, that's completely uh, acceptable. We can replace um, uh, the chocolate with a llama in striped pajamas, the yellow dog like the llama in striped pajamas. We can replace it with the yellow dog, the yellow dog like the yellow dog. I mean, it's a little bit of a silly sentence, but it's allowed, right? So, so we can replace that with things that are DPs, which means that that thing down there is a DP. If we're gonna analyze the internal structure of a verb phrase, a VP, um, we just have to we just have to figure out what this blue category is here. This this um, this category that is is where liked sits. What can we replace liked with um, in order to create a grammatical sentence? Um, and what we're going to call this category is a transitive verb or a V subscript T, right? So this is going to be our category transitive verb. And as we'll see, we can replace it with other things that are transitive verbs, but you can't replace it with things that aren't transitive verbs. For example, we can replace the word liked with the word kissed. The yellow dog kissed the chocolate cake is perfectly acceptable. So liked can be replaced with kissed. Um, we can also, there are some multi-word verbs that we can slot into this. We can say cleaned up. The yellow dog cleaned up the chocolate cake is perfectly fine. Um, there are plenty of things that we can't put in this slot. So we can put that baby. The yellow dog, that baby, the chocolate cake. That is not a sentence of English, right? So we can't replace liked with that baby. And we can't replace it with certain verbs. So the yellow dog replied the chocolate cake. So there are some verbs that we can't put in that slot, um, but there are some verbs we can. So any of the verbs that we decide go into that category that can go in that slot are gonna be allowed to go in that slot, right? When we're looking at the internal structure of our verb phrase, we can see that it's made up of two pieces. We can replace that transitive verb with a whole bunch of other transitive verbs. We could replace that DP, that determiner phrase, with a bunch of other determiner phrases, um, and those come together to make a verb phrase. When we abstract away, we see that VT and DP come together to form a VP, so a VT plus a DP equals a verb phrase. Um, and we can put that rule into our grammar. The grammar we had before, let's just plop that last rule in. So now we have a grammar with three rules. Um, and if we, ha if we can, if you as a child des decide what are the determiners I can use, what are the noun phrases I can use, what are the verb, uh, transitive verbs I can use, what are the determiner, you know, what, what are the, you know, determiner phrases I can use, and we can slap those together and create a whole lot more sentences than you could create just by memorizing each sentence by itself already. Just with three rules, we can do a lot. Um, with three rules in a dictionary, we can do a lot more than we can with just a dictionary. Now, of course, a child is actually going to learn many more than three rules. Learning more than three rules will allow them to learn more types of sentences. So let's look at what we've talked about, about what a child has to do in order to learn a language um, really quickly, uh, just to wrap this lesson up. So um, we've already talked about how identifying the constituents in a sentence helps you evaluate its internal structure. And once you've evaluated its internal structure, um, you can use that to identify syntactic categories, and that's what we've looked at um, here. We, you can see, oh, look, these, these, plop, these types of pieces just plop together, and you can use anything of that type in order to replace anything else of its own type, right? Um, and once you know syntactic categories and how you combine them, this allows you to create infinite novel sentences, which is essential to knowing how to speak a language for real, is that you don't just have sentences memorized, you can create infinite novel new sentences out of the rules that you've learned. So that's how um, you put together a grammar full of rules uh, that can create lots of sentences for you.